Hi, wall outlet USB charger things are up today. So are they primarily wall sockets or are they primarily USB ports? I don't know, but today they're going to be tested like USB power adapters. There are many types and wattages on the market now, so I picked a pretty general offering of these things. The Leviton being the most expensive, but also one of the most anticipated probably. There are many cheaper ones. The Anchor snuck in too. There are a bunch of brands I've never heard of. Certainly a few XYZ brands in there. Toppler, as in topple-er, word soup. Probably supposed to be top electric. Anyway, these will all get tested for way too many things for a short YouTube video. I don't expect any surprises. I'm not gonna show much of the testing since there are so many adapters and data. I'll do a speed run for a teardown on a couple of these too. Just a real quick look at two of these. There is an affiliate link, which earns me a couple of percent, but costs you nothing in the description, as well as links for more information. Many thanks to my patrons and channel supporters. The detailed data is on Patreon. I'm going to go through these real fast because there are eight of them to get through. There's no specific rhyme or reason to the order. To me, they are just one through eight. First up is not actually an in-wall USB power thing, but an alternate product that looked interesting. This basically gives you the same effect, but cheaper and easier. I have seen some of these that actually screw in, but this one just plugs in. This is not a great device. It is a 5 volt only device. It does limit the power per port, so it has at least some basic management inside, but it's mostly a power strip. This does claim to be a surge suppressor as well, but I didn't check that. As a USB power adapter, it's not great. In terms of its basic performance, there is really no surprise at all. Although the DC voltage is on target, it is not all that stable. The ripple voltage is higher than I'd like to see for a 5 volt device. This is pretty significant. Also, the efficiency that falls as the power level increases is not great. This is probably overdriving a small power supply. At this price point, there are power adapters with much better construction and performance. Just get a separate power strip. Next up is the most featured charger today in terms of modes of operation. This USB wall outlet and charger does a lot. It is still held back though. It has the PPS modes, but they are limited in current output to only three amps maximum. The device with two USB-C ports does mean that it does renegotiate power on plugs and unplugs. This is also the charger with the most watts for the day, 65 watts in the wall. This is pushing things pretty far, and it will be interesting to check out the thermals on this adapter later on to see if this thing can do that without getting too hot. It is certainly large enough. The extra power level does come with some extra cost. A little bit more idle power usage, but compared with the first one on efficiency, this level is much more reasonable on this one. It's still not as good as the best 65 watt external adapters, but it's at least as good as ones that overheat. Yeah, it's a mess. In terms of the performance of this charger, the DC output voltages look fine, the ripple was within a reasonable range for the voltage levels being supplied, and the efficiency looked much more normal for a USB power adapter, but it could be higher. Okay, the next USB wall outlet is the Leviton 60 watt dual USB-C port thing. This is the second largest charger today, and it has a pretty big brand name behind it. It as do all the adapters looked at today, carries a safety listing, meaning it should be at least less risky to use this device. In terms of the modes of operation, the noted missing items are PPS and the 12 volt mode, typical. The device dropped the voltage to 15 volt max when two ports are used. The socket is also the most expensive one looked at today, and it does something for that extra money at least. It will be by far the most efficient USB adapter of the day. It's well into the class of good adapters for this power level. Anyway, with this extra power level, can it keep the voltage output stable and under control? Yes, it does a good job here. So overall, as a power adapter, this seems pretty good. With that higher efficiency, I bet the thermal performance is going to be better as well, which is important for an adapter that gets shoved into a closed box in a wall. Next up is the 4 Harvest USB wall outlet. This adapter has some issues. It's going to be a theme, isn't it? The cost is fine. The extra feature on this one is a night light. There's a little switch to turn on and off the light. It doesn't have a sensor. It is another 5 volt only device, so no extra modes, but also no power renegotiation. It just works when you plug the cable in as long as you don't overload it. This one struggled to provide the claimed power in total. The charger has low efficiency, as we already mentioned. It is 
very stable at least. The DC output voltage looks good, low ripple voltage, and stable DC output basically stayed on target across the entire range. The tests were done with the light off for efficiency. Okay, yet another one. This one is a cheap one. The efficiency is low, but average. Still doesn't meet the energy efficiency requirements if it was a standalone USB power brick. This is another 5 volt only device. This is turning into a theme. In terms of the DC power performance, this device did okay in terms of the average voltage, but this device is pretty substantially high on the voltage ripple. The output was pretty unstable. The efficiency fell as the device used more power, so this is likely a smaller power adapter and they are pushing the limits of the small adapter to get more watts. This does not bode well for the longevity of this device. Okay, next is the Anker 30 watt wall USB adapter with PD. This one finally has some more modes of operation for a mid power device. It has three ports, which is a lot for a low power device, but this one loses a power outlet. Plenty of space for things at least. The device does not have any PPS or 12 volt mode, which would have been nice. Being a PD compliant device, this will renegotiate on additional ports being used, but it is smart in that it won't renegotiate until power is used. You do pay for those extra features though, for 30 watts, the efficiency is not terrible, not amazing either. In terms of the DC power performance, this device has very low voltage ripple and stable output voltages. The efficiency was high enough that this is a reasonable choice for an in-wall power socket if you are concerned about the power quality. Okay, next is this Abotec wall outlet with USB. This outlet has moderate cost, but it does go up to 30 watts, so it should be able to do a little more. That cost didn't help the efficiency though. This thing is on the very low side for a modern device. This wouldn't meet any modern efficiency standards. I have transformer wall bricks that can do better than this. It does limit the power at least to each port, so you can't pull more than five amps from one port. This is pushing it, as it doesn't check for the USB cable type, so it could overload some cables. Technically, this should work with the Raspberry Pi 5, 4 amps, but no, don't do it. Efficiency. In terms of the DC power performance, this one is stable on first look, but the ripple voltages on the output was quite high. I think this is pushing the components a bit too far for the sake of claiming it has more usable watts. Although it will hit the claim 30 watts, it's not happy doing it. This is probably a skip based on this data. Okay, last up is the top greener. This wall socket has moderate cost, but it has the same issue as a lot of these. It's pretty weak on the efficiency side. This one being more expensive though, I would expect a bit better performance for that extra cost. It is another 5 volt only device. In terms of the DC power performance, it's about average. The DC voltage was stable, the ripple gets a little bit high, but not unreasonable. The main thing to note here is that the efficiency steadily declines as more power is drawn from this adapter. This means something. It's probably stretching the limit a little bit. Okay, time for a quick teardown of these things. This is going to be speed mode. I'm not going to get into the transformer or things. I'm just going to look for some general isolation and a few components and wiring to see how some of these look inside. The anchor and the top greener are getting the treatment today. If you want to see all of these tore down, leave it down in the comments. So many of the same thing. The top greener is a 21 watt USB power adapter. It has star screws and honestly comes apart really easily. It's actually kind of what I would call repairable. The components are pretty well spaced out and I don't see any issues with the construction. It notably doesn't have much for an input filter. This was seen in the data on the AC side being noisy. The output side is well isolated with double insulated wires visible coming out of the transformer. The components all have appropriate ratings and it's just a real compact and simple design. The main issue here is that the components look a bit small, which is probably why the efficiency is suffering. It's a lot to ask of the skinny wires on that transformer. The USB board has all the power rails paralleled. It is using resistors on the CC lines to provide 5 volt instruction to PD devices, but this isn't an actual protocol chip, so it is always on and can't cut the power off. It looks like there is no optocoupler, so this is relying on primary side feedback only. Considering that, it's stable enough. Okay, time to get the anchor apart. Triangle screws, then Phillips inside. It looks like a different product. 
The main difference is that this being a 30 watt class device, it has some bigger components. Also clearly visible in this one is the presence of a fairly substantial input filter. The output side is also much more complicated. I've torn down other Anchor products and the isolation side to side is very good as expected. All the components have appropriate ratings. It's an interesting problem to solve, how to get all this stuff into an outlet and keep the outlet working. Although Anchor dropped one of the sockets, but they certainly didn't sacrifice on isolation. This one does have an optocoupler and a pretty substantial USB negotiation chip to handle the power distribution, as it can do multiple voltages and USB PD. So these USB outlet things all have safety listings and I expect at a minimum they meet the criteria of the top greener in terms of components. The Anchor does a bit more. So that extra money is going into some more substantial components. The capacitors all look like 105 degrees C. They do use electrolytic auxiliary capacitors. The basic input structure is going to be the same on all of these chargers. No power factor correction as expected, not that there is room for it. Thermally, I didn't look at too many of these adapters. The five volt only ones tended to turn off every few minutes at max load, so never got to thermal soak. The 65 ones did stay on, however, and they had a very different thermal effects, and it's pretty interesting. The cheaper 65 watt Amerisense did what I would call a horrendous job of dealing with heat. It dumps all the heat into the back of the electrical box, and very little comes to the face of the device. So you may think, oh, it's not too hot. Meanwhile, the wire and plastic are melting in the box. I tested with the cover off, so best case. This is a direct result of the low efficiency. When switching over to the other high wattage in-wall adapter, which focused on efficiency, the Leviton did something very different. It didn't get hot inside the wall. There is more heat at the face of the device, and with the efficiency, there's less heat being generated. So a cooler device and a heat is provided towards the face of the device, so sealing off the box won't get overheated. They both did stay on, but one of these is gonna last a lot longer. In terms of isolation, which is the thing that separates the danger side, the mains, from you on the low voltage side, these adapters were quite all over the place. The plug-in one was not bad, but interesting, the larger name brand devices tested worse here. But in general, these all should not cause the tingling feeling you get sometimes from the metal body of a laptop or phone screen, because they will be fixed to that 120 volt mode, they were all at acceptable levels for this voltage range. Some of the cheap ones actually did much better here though. When looking at the ground connection to the USB ports, one of these devices, the Abotech, has a diode in that path, so in one direction there's a direct connection to the earth. This is different to all the other devices, which had the same isolation to earth as all the other AC pins, which is, they were not connected at all. This seems to be the normal situation. There are some cases where gear can be earthed here. A soldering iron is an example, but this doesn't have the power for that anyway, so I'm not sure why they went in this direction. Okay, time to compare these wall outlets with USB ports. They all generally look pretty similar. The main noted difference is the Leviton having wires for connection instead of a screw down terminals, and the one over the wall plate option, which yeah, it's cheap. It's a bad USB adapter, but it's cheap. Wait, isn't so important for these, but included for completeness. There's no particular trend to the weights. The main thing that matters for these plugs is size though, mostly the width and depth of the adapter. This is to make sure they can fit in an actual plug box. They are mostly the same size, but there are a few standout items. The anchor is about one millimeter wider and the anchor and Leviton is a bit more deep than the others. They are all surprisingly close though. I mean, they have to fit in a normal electrical box. The Leviton was the only one that didn't come with a faceplate, sold separately. In terms of value, they are spread out a bit, but it's a relative thing since a lot of these are hot garbage for power adapters. So they're more like expensive AC sockets with some limited USB charging capabilities. Of the three chargers that had more capability, the Anchor, the Leviton, and the Amerisense, the Amerisense has the most apparent value. But as we saw on the thermals, don't expect it to last long. It's cheaper for a reason. The Leviton seems overpriced, but there are some design choices that make sense, like keeping the efficiency higher so it doesn't get too hot and break too soon. So to answer the question, are they worth it? No. Not even close, just get a normal wall adapter.
When looking at the idle graph for these, they are all pretty good. Considering you can't unplug these and they are going to be installed in the wall and therefore powered all the time, they really do need to have low idle power consumption and all of them achieve this. The Amerisense was the only one that pushed the boundary a little bit. The Leviton, Anchor, Toppler, and Abotec are good performers for both having low idle power usage and lower AC noise levels. So none of them are losing the efficiency battle on idle power usage at least. The average power consumption graph is more spread out, and this is really what tripped some of these to not be energy efficiency compliant. The standard technically doesn't apply to these though, so you won't see the six in a circle on these, but I can still do the test, and in general these suck. The Anchor and Amerisense made the grade, but they are still pretty poor. This means that these adapters are expected to get quite warm in operation, which is not so great for a device that is sealed in a box in the wall. The Leviton was the light at the end of the dimmer switch. This one did great here. It showed in the thermals too. There are more USB power adapters, this time with AC wall plugs attached to them. Or maybe that's the other way around. They mostly don't really have any highlights or reasons for getting them. Most of them are not USB PD compliant. Most of them are very poor efficiency wise. The ones that are okay compared to a conventional wall brick are still worse, probably a product of the form factor. Also, when they inevitably break from getting too hot, they are much more difficult to replace or repair. You have to call an electrician to replace these so you can charge your phone. While it's broken in the wall, who knows how much power it's drawing too. The one thing that stood out is of course the most expensive one, the Leviton. It just seemed to have some design decisions that made sense to me, like higher efficiency and better thermal management, which is important. Will it last longer? Maybe. The Leviton of course did lack PPS and the 12 volt mode, so none of these are even close to ideal. Otherwise, yeah, a bunch of alphabet soup skips. So I don't use any of these, I just bring a brick with me. You can't plan on them being places, so you will probably have a charger anyway. Thanks for watching. There's links in the description. Did you make it this far? Why? Goodbye.